Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm really very pleased to be in the company of some very important scholars here about the um, <clears throat> Armenian issue. I'm glad, but actually I should say I'm intrigued to be able to moderate this particular session. This rather just won't go away topic of the Armenian issue, quite a persistent issue of the past 100 years. Now, whenever I hear the 100 years invoked, it reminds me how right was exactly 100 years ago, in 1916, an author by the name of Dixon Johnson, a British author of his 1916 book about 100 years ago, The Armenians, appalled over the deceitful practices of his book subject said, give a lie 20 hours start, it will take 100 years to take over. And I say that, 100 years have gone and gone by, and we are overtaking it. But I don't want to get ahead of myself because we have four scholars here, uh, which would, they will be talking about, about the prospects for resolution and reconciliation of the Armenian issue, which is the subject matter of this particular session. First, we'll have Professor Justin McCarthy, who will be talking about the impossible reconciliation, which might sound like we are starting on the negative, but there's a positive to which it's almost called to arms, not to armaments, but to sharpen our pencils, uh, as we'll hear about it shortly. And next, we'll have PhD candidate Tal Boynas, and who, who will focus on American involvement in both the creation of the American-Turkish conflict and the control of the discourse of, about it. Next, Esquire David Salzman will consider the legal dimension of reconciliation and whether this helps or inhibits prospects for reconciliation. And finally, but most importantly, Dr. Refik Turan, being a historian that he is, he will go back not only 100 years, but 1,000 years to 1016, when Amer Armenians first met the Seljuk Turks and locked arms in friendship. But somehow, they ended up locking horns 900 years later, in 1916, shall we say, and somebody threw away the key to that lock. And the rest is an intriguing story, which we will be hearing from Dr. Turan. So first, Justin McCarthy, please. We've got to get the machines going here. What? You'll be, we're, we're still waiting to get something up. You'll be glad to know, ah, there we go. I'm not going to give you a long speech on the Turkish-Armenian situation because I only have 10 minutes, or I think it's now down to eight minutes. That being the case, I want to talk to you instead about the, uh, the idea of reconciliation as it's expressed in the beginning of this talk. I first started coming to ATAA meetings well, decades ago when Shukur Elekta was the ambassador. And at that time, people were speaking about the need for reconciliation between the Turks and the Armenians. And people are still talking about reconciliation between the Turks and the Armenians. This talk is based on the prospects for reconciliation and resolution. And forget it. The time for wishful thinking about this is over. There is not going to be any reconciliation. When the Turkish president expressed his sorrow at the events of World War I, 
How many apologies came from the Armenian president for what the Armenians did to the Turks? Did Armenian nationalists ever express sorrow for what happened in World War I? When Turkey suggested a historical commission, the Armenian Republic said it would only be involved if Turkey first said there was a genocide. Then they'd talk. To Turks, the term reconciliation has always meant let's put this behind us and let's be friends again. To Armenian radical nationalists, reconciliation has meant something quite different. As they always say, first, Turkey should admit there was a genocide. Second, Turkey should pay reparations. And third, Turkey should give up Eastern Anatolia. Now, I want to look very briefly at what they describe. First of all, Turkey should admit genocide. Uh, I won't go into why that's ridiculous, but simply go to paying reparations. There is actually an Armenian reparation study group that has figured out exactly how much Turkey should pay to Armenians. And the amount Turkey should pay to Armenians is the amount you see up there, the $104 trillion that are to be paid to Armenians. To give you an idea, if I can make this work, if I can, uh, to give you an idea of what is supposed to be paid here, these are the reparations compared to the Turkish government expenditures. I think I probably have, should go back one. There we go. These are the expenditures that Turkey is expected to make. All right. The Turkish government, as you can see in red, this is how much the Turkish government spends in a year. In the blue or the purple there, this is how much Turkey is supposed to give to the Armenians. In the very small amount that you see on the far right, that's the amount that the Armenian government itself spends every year. Or in other words, Turkey is, expended to, is expected to pay the Armenians about 100 times as much as the Armenian government spends on itself in a year. If you want to make another comparison, this is how much Turkey spends on education in a year. This is how much Turkey spends on the Turkish army and Navy and Air Force in a year. And this is compared to what the Armenians expect that the Turks are going to give them. I would suggest that anyone who thinks that Turkey is going to do this kind of thing needs definite psychiatric care. This is something that is completely impossible, completely is out of the question, but this is what they demand. Finally, this is the land that they demand. This is the land that's demanded by the Armenian nationalists. As you can see, it includes land taken from Azerbaijan, taken from Georgia, and of course, mostly taken from the Turkish Republic. Over there on the left in the graphs, you can see how much of this land is actually occupied by Turks and Turks Kurds, by Turkish Muslims, and how much, how many Armenians there are in the world. As you can see, there are more Turkish citizens in the land claimed by Armenia. There are many more than there are all the Armenians in the world. The land that they wish to take over is land that is occupied not only is it occupied by Muslims today, it was occupied three to one back in 1915. What they're being asked, what they're asking for then, is an impossibility from every aspect. An impossibility historically, an impossibility politically, an impossibility economically. People who say they want this sort of thing, the radical Armenian nationalists, are not people with whom you can have reconciliation. They are people who are never going to change. Now, what is to be done about this? Well, this isn't a question for historians. Historians study an issue not for its political ramification. We study, we try to study real history, and we want to find out what actually happened. Not what's good for Turks or good for Armenians, but what actually happened. And we have actually come pretty close to understanding everything that went on in World War I. We know that Armenians revolted in Vaughan. 
in the Northeast, in Zeitun, in Marash. We know that they attacked telegraph lines, officials, army convoys, that they blocked roads. We know that they acted as agents of the Russian invaders. Now the Ottomans rightly feared them, and they feared more actions from the Armenians, and so they decided on relocation. Relocation was a standard policy of governments at the time. It had been done before the Ottomans ever did in South Africa. It had been done by the Americans in the Philippines. The actions of the Ottoman government were sometimes inconsistent, sometimes confused. Armenians undoubtedly did suffer. Right? There was disease, there was hunger, there were bandits. Everyone suffered of these things, Muslims, Armenians, Jews, Greeks, all the people of the Ottoman Empire. But it is true that the mortality of Armenians and Muslims in the war zone was approximately the same. In terms of the issue of genocide, uh, historians have dealt with that issue. There wasn't any. It's only a matter of using bad definitions. The question is, though, Historians have studied genocide. We've studied World War I. We've studied all these things. The question is not whether it's true or not. We've established that. The question is, will we be heard? Because in order to be heard, all that historians need is free speech. And the radical Armenian nationalists will always oppose free speech. Someone has to fight against them. But we historians, we're not politicians. Most of us are not even Turks. The fight to stop, the fight to end the accusations, it has to be your fight. It has to be the fight of Turks. And it can't just be the fight of the Turkish government. Depending on the Turkish government is a mistake. And the reason for that, the reason for that is this. The Turkish government has an awful lot to do. The Turkish government has problems that are immense. The Turkish government is only affected very little by Armenian demands. Now people might say, oh well, Armenians are forcing Turkey not to get into the EU. That's not true at all. The French aren't prejudiced against Turks because of what Armenians say. The Turks listen to Armenians because they're, I mean the French, listen to Armenians because they're already prejudiced against the Turks. And the Austrians are exactly the same way. And as for whether the Armenians can keep you out of the EU, I hope for your sake they do. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, Turkey is attacked by wolves, foreign wolves, domestic wolves. Compared to the wolves, the Armenians are like mosquitoes. They're annoying, but they're not the main problem that Turkey has to worry about. <laughs> I don't know what the Turkish government thinks or plans. They don't tell me. But it appears to me that when it comes to the Armenians, the Turkish government has decided to ignore the mosquitoes. Occasionally they swatted a mosquito, but they're much more concerned with greater problems. Because my time is very limited here, I simply want to say that this is a problem, but it's a problem for the Turks, not a problem for the government. It's a problem for you. And it's people like Do Perinchik, Meli Berk, Oya Bain, the regular Turks, those are the ones that are probably going to be able to solve this problem. Those are the ones that are going to fight to allow us historians to have our free speech. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McCarthy. Uh, that was a very insightful uh, speech. So what it says is that it's a call to arms, not to armaments, but to sharpen our pencils and also make sure that we are heard. So with that, I will turn the podium to uh, Mr. Tal Boenis, who is a PhD candidate. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. And I'll start uh, 
with the bottom line, both what happened to the Armenians in the final century of the Ottoman Empire and what has been said about what happened was and is largely affected by American power. The conflict was part of an American strategy to influence the balance of power in Europe in the decades that eventually led to World War I. And the discourse about the conflict is part of a sophisticated method to keep the strategy hidden by dividing and ruling Turks and Armenians. <coughs> to Turks, this is a pesky Armenian issue. To Armenians, this is a national ethos about a Turkish crime. However, the plans for both conflict and discourse were made in the USA. Prior to the impact of the American presence in Ottoman territory in the 19th century, there was no intense conflict between the Ottoman government and its Armenians. For centuries, as long as the Armenians were truly an ethno-religious group, not a rebellious group, the Armenian existence in the Ottoman Empire was just fine. It was not a perfect example of civil rights, but nothing stood out about the Armenian existence as a religious minority in the Ottoman Empire. It is widely known that during that time in certain parts of Christian Europe, the treatment of a certain religious minority was by far less kind. Matters became conflictual after the Ottoman Armenian identity was transformed by the American missionaries in a meticulous and gradual process. In the 1820s, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign, uh, for Foreign Missions studied and evaluated the Armenian people. Soon followed a program to convert the already Christian Armenians, not into becoming even more Christian or super Christian, but into becoming an American-styled Protestant. For the Americans, Protestantism had already proven itself as a stimulator of a revolutionary mentality. You take away Protestantism from history, you take away modern nationalism. Americans attracted the Ottoman Armenians and then injected them with a Protestant identity. The Ottoman Armenians were not simply turned from a religious group to a different religious group. They turned from a religious group to a rebellious group. The Americans crushed the cultural heritage of this people and introduced a new religious ideology through which it was possible to establish a new Armenian use of language, a new Armenian organization, a new Armenian leadership, and a new Armenian purpose. Between the time of the American arrival and the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, the American Bible Society translated, printed, and distributed literature for the Ottoman population at the cost of nearly $3 million. This would have the value of hundreds of millions of dollars today. It was even more expensive to acquire property and operate schools. The Americans had this money to invest in imperialist activities. They had the power to do so. Britain's military power cleared the path for American economic and cultural power, which would then be translated into political activities that were favorable to Anglo-American interests. The growing American control of information in the lives of Armenians through education and the press enabled the Americans to tell the Armenians who they are, who they ought to be, and what they ought to do. The Americans even phased out the people's own name, Haik, and replaced it with the name Armenian. Why? Because the name Armenian was recognizable in Anglo-American culture. The name Haik was not recognizable. It still is not. You will not find it in an English dictionary. This is Orientalism on steroids. Some might call it cultural genocide. Whatever you call it, the Haik people became known as Armenians so that the Anglo-American public and then the rest of the world would find the Armenian, Armenian bid for national independence more legitimate. The name Armenia appeared in Anglo-American memory of ancient history, but the name had not been used by the Haik people themselves. They didn't call themselves Armenian until the introduction of American influence. The people's patriarch, Mateos, tried to defend his community from losing its Haikness, its very identity, not for the sake of the Ottoman government, but for the sake of preserving the community's own way of living. Those Armenians who collaborated with the Americans were characterized by the patriarch in an anathema as wicked. He even described some of them as Judas. However, even the people's very own voice was drowned out in the sea of American power. 
Mateus could visualize what was coming, but was unable to make the whole community see the imperialist exploitation and the fate of a catastrophe. In 1846, said to be the year of the rupture in the American war on an Armenian identity, as the people were being de and de ottomanized Mateus implored, implored his people to reject the emerging American-empowered Armenian leadership, reject what he called the, and this is a quote, venomous serpent in their houses, which will one day injure them with its deadly poison, and they will lose their souls. What happened to them is a classic case of a neocolonial bond in which an American-inspired native leadership, such as the, the new Armenian elite, was more faithful to its American imperialist creator and sustainer than to its own people. Thus, the Armenian revolutionaries would be led against the Ottoman sovereignty and recklessly serve American interests while their actions would be seen and remembered, not as American, but as Armenian, Yani of the Armenian people. And then you might see Americans talk about self-determination and democracy, but it's more like a, a ventro ventriloquist act. The Armenian question was raised as if a non-American question. James Bryce was the main political figure in Britain to raise it. It made his career. While he is associated with the British Liberal Party, Bryce would be more accurately described as an agent of Anglo-American interests. If one looks closely at his affiliations, this becomes apparent. A close affinity with Andrew Carnegie, who championed the idea of a globally dominant British-American union, a friendship with Theodore Roosevelt that goes back to the 1880s, a correspondence with many of the American political elites, cooperation with the most influential media in the US, a heavy involvement in trade and international law, and presidency of the American Political Science Association while serving as the British ambassador to the United States. Can you imagine a Turkish diplomat sitting on top of the American organization that controls what people are taught about politics in universities? Already in the late 1870s, Bryce declared it a British interest to have an independent Armenian state on Ottoman land. He called for the Armenians to be armed and encouraged to fight for their own state, and he publicized it as part of a broader Eastern question. In other words, the Armenian question was raised when it was time to reap the political fruits of the sowing done by the American missionaries. To the Anglo-American public, this was simply part of a moral duty to civilize the world, the white man's burden. It might be needless to say that this moralistic language was used to boost support from the public for what would otherwise be seen for what it was, imperialist aggression. Consider the words in this 1881 article in the New York Times, which expresses an American pride in the progress made by the American school in Istanbul, Robert College, toward the replacement of Turks with Bulgarians and Armenians in government. So the following is a collection of lines from that article in 1881. By most who know Turkey well, it is believed that the race who will come to the front when the possessions of the sick man are divided will be the Bulgarians. The Armenians, too, have a future of importance, and they appeal especially to the sympathies of our religious community. The year is not distant when the Sultanate falls and a new power holds the golden gate between Asia and Europe. There is something profoundly interesting and inspiring in the thought that an American college will prepare the minds and characters of the youth who shall sway that new state and lay the foundations for a new Christian civilization on the site of the capital of the Eastern Empire. This rhetoric appeared on page six of the New York Times on March 27, 1881. This is an imperialist plan laid out not at a time of war. Does this seem like neutrality to you? The American historiography would have us think that because of the advertised commitment to honor the Monroe Doctrine, the United States did not intervene in the affairs of Europe until April 6, 1917, when it joined the war efforts against the Central Powers. This historical perspective shows otherwise. If we pay attention to the available data on American involvement in inflaming rebellion against the Ottoman government, be it through Bulgarians in European Turkey or through Armenians in Asiatic Turkey, a different story unfolds, a story of a great power struggle between the US and Germany. 
before World War I, and it took two costly world wars to resolve it. The US won, and we lost the ability to see this period of Ottoman history from a non-American perspective. The genocide discourse on Armenian victimhood is at the front line, the front line of an American defense, an outer layer of concealment that keeps the public from recognizing the American imperialist ambitions that existed even before World War I. The New York Times that made the American imperialist agenda palatable in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, is the same New York Times that along with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, indoctrinated the American public and the rest of the world into absorbing the term genocide. It uses the Armenian case as an example of genocide simply because it has the power to do so, like some bully. This same New York Times is using the term genocide nowadays along with the American controlled genocide scholarship just as another layer, not just as another layer to protect American historiography, but also as a tool to carry out a variety of American policies and meet American interests. Do I have two more minutes? That's great. The most underpronounced current affair that would explain why American power is shoving the Armenian heavy genocide discourse down our throats is the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. A word search in the database of the New York Times reveals an interesting trend in the juxtaposition between the genocide discourse and what happened to the Armenians in 1915 and the coverage of the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. Between the years 2000 and 2010, a whole decade, Nagorno-Karabakh appears in about 50 articles. Now, the combination of words Armenian and genocide used as a phrase, you'll see that in around 200 uh, uh, times in the New York Times during that decade. Meaning for every one reference to Nagorno-Karabakh, <laughs> for every one reference to Nagorno-Karabakh, there were around four references to Armenian and genocide as an expression. A 2015 search I anticipate would show that results are even more lopsided. But here's the kicker. Here, here's something that's really interesting about about this data, neither of the references to Nagorno-Karabakh in that decade appeared in the title of the article, zero. Not a single headline in that whole decade in the New York Times said Nagorno-Karabakh. Meaning the newspaper doesn't want to establish a familiarity between the public and the name of the region. In 2011, the one time there was a mini title that said Nagorno-Karabakh, it was in a letter to the editor written by an Armenian representative, and it was anti-Azeri. So there's also significant bias in how Nagorno-Karabakh is described when it is mentioned. Nagorno-Karabakh is said to be, on the pages of the New York Times, it's said to be an ethnic Armenian enclave inside Azerbaijan. The, New York, the um, English uh, dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, also describes the region as ethnically Armenian, meaning you have the two Anglo-American powerhouses of information telling you that the region is ethnically Armenian. Does the discourse say that Jackson, Mississippi is an African enclave inside an Anglo-Saxon Republic, an ethnically African region? It doesn't, but why not? If 80% of the people in that area are of an African descent. American power wants the public to consider the Armenian conquest of Nagorno-Karabakh as legitimate. Over a million people were displaced and tens of thousands of people were killed, mostly Azeris, as a result of the Nagorno-Karabakh War, an event that was uh, much more recent than World War I, an event that is still unresolved. It is an ongoing conflict, not a false memory. It seems as if it is an American interest to empower the Armenian people, to impassion them, to spoon feed them and the public with the idea of their victimhood this sense of having been wronged, of having been denied something, of being justified, of being righteous when they forcefully took a chunk of land from the Azeris, from the Turkic people, as if this somehow evens the score. The Armenian people were wronged, mostly by Anglo-Americans, but the Turkic people have been wronged twice. Two wrongs do not make a right, and three wrongs definitely do not make a right. But the ability to use the term genocide is not a matter of morality, it is a matter of might, the power to control identities and memories. 
like morality, like education, like history, like information, like the press, like law, like an international convention. The use of the term genocide is a function of power, and power in our world is overwhelmingly American. Thank you. Interesting that uh, Mr. Boyanis, I, I like the term he used, he said that the use of the term genocide is not reality, but it is... Not morality. Not a matter of morality. Morality? Who's to say what's reality? Yeah, There's who's to say what's concern. reality? Well, actually, his paper is um, entitled American Power in Genocide. In terms of the American involvement in both the creation of the Armenian-Turkish conflict and the control, and I'd like to underline that, of the discourse about it. Now, I should also add that <clears throat> there is a very interesting book, I call it a treatise, that Professor McCarthy wrote called The Turk in America, which is really, <clears throat> really shows where the source of this, shall I say, the genocidal knowledge that was spread across America comes from. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, uh, representing it uh, correctly. Uh, the, oh, the more books you sell, the better. <laughs> <laughs> we are giving them away. But in any case, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyanis. That was uh, actually, I think that's a new area of um, research, I must say, because I don't think we are, we have been involved in the role of America in terms of how this whole Armenian issue has been spread across this land, really. So, um, having said that, <clears throat> it's my great pleasure now to introduce Esquire David Salzman, who will be <clears throat> actually um, look at the legal dimension of reconciliation and whether this helps or inhibits prospects for reconciliation and resolution. Uh, David Salzman. Can we go away with this? I don't know. Just bear with me one second, please. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's good. Okay. All right. Uh, I've got a picture of a cup of coffee. That's good. That'll keep me awake. Um, you know, one must always be attentive to the limits of one's own ignorance. So I definitely feel like an outlier on this panel. Uh, Sevgin was correct in saying we had a panel of scholars, except where I'm concerned. Uh, I'm just the lawyer. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, there's a certain power to that. Um, addressing reconciliation from a legal angle, there is a short answer. Everyone's beginning by giving a short answer. The answer is, can law help or inhibit uh, reconciliation between Armenians and Turks? And Professor McCarthy said, well, the Armenians have thrown up, uh, a, if not a litmus test, a condition precedent for getting into any talks that could result in reconciliation. In that case, it is recognition of a genocide or some sort of other admission. Uh, in the case of law, yes, it can help, but it only helps after there is some sort of agreement to put aside preconditions like that. So the primary example I would give of that is Yes, law can be a very effective tool for this case to be raised, particularly at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. The U.S. is a party to it. Turkey is a party to the convention that creates this. Uh, Armenia is also. Uh, but the parties have to agree that the court has jurisdiction over this particular matter. And there is no forceful jurisdiction before this court. There is what we have. Uh, called compromisory jurisdiction. So you have to get most of the way to the finish line to then have law provide you the complete result. Uh, as we all know from previous talks I've delivered to you uh, and have gotten into the weeds of, um, the Armenians have shied away from this approach. Uh, it's, it's 
understood by all of us why. If you can win on the political ground, if you can dominate the airwaves, pu out publish, out convince, utilize the levers of power to your advantage, why take a risk before a seemingly neutral arbiter? So uh, we never get there. That provides the rest of the short answer, which is law will not provide uh, the solution. It will not contribute to reconciliation. Therefore, the opposite must be true. It is an irritant at this point. Um, in the past, I've summarized for you varieties of cases. Uh, Perinchek case before the European Court of Human Rights. We have a second Perinchek case. We had a very recent decision that somewhat bore on the issue before the French Constitutional Court. Kind of boring stuff. We also had, in the United States, uh, insurance cases where Armenians said that insurance companies uh, who held policies of those who died in World War I but were never collected upon, that these somehow are reparations cases. And uh, what do we end up with in these? Uh, as of yet, no result that would satisfy the Armenians that these constitute reparations. And no result from the Turkish side either that this is a loss or anything more than an irritant. So rather than get into the weeds of legal cases like I've done in the past, I want to maybe almost do it by a show of hands. I'm going to give you three ways in which the law does impact this issue, and maybe we could decide among ourselves which one you're most interested in, and we can delve into it a little bit. It gives us a chance to exercise and raise our arms a little bit. So the three ways the law is involved here is uh, whether the events themselves can be considered genocide under the law. A similar question is whether a lawsuit alleging the crime of genocide against the Ottoman Empire, people now dead, uh, or the present Republic of Turkey, whether this can succeed. Another way the law is involved in this issue is whether civil damages for allegations uh, such as property theft, personal damage, death, destruction, you name it, whether, they, whether these civil damages can be obtained in a domestic court in the United, State, United States. And finally, whether the U.S. legal system can be used to guarantee the expression of the Turkish viewpoint on history, whether it can be used to suppress the Armenian viewpoint on history, whether it can be used to claim damages for the insult to all Turks or the Republic of Turkey embodied by the Armenian viewpoint on history, or whether one can claim damages for being personally insulted, for being called a genocide denier, a hater, or any of these other slurs. So, okay, we've got three things. Uh, we can give a show of hands. So one is, uh, I'll, I'll just summarize them for you before we vote. One is, uh, can the events themselves be considered genocide under law? Two is, whether damages can be obtained in US courts, uh, civil damages for the alleged acts in World War I, or whether the US legal system can be used to either promote your viewpoint or suppress another. So let's see, a show of hands on number one, whether uh, the events themselves being considered genocide under law. Okay, that was underwhelming. All right, number two. Or, or okay. not. For, we're, no, no, whether you want to hear more about this or at least hear a little, uh, or we can wait till Q&A. Um, I know we have a long panel here. Uh, you can even raise, we'll make I'll, that. I'll pick number one. Make choice for Okay, Justin wants to hear about whether these can be considered genocide under law. You, you've got a big hand there. Whether civil damages for the allegations can be had in U.S. court. Anyone interested in that? Oh, we've got some hands there. All right, I'd get a half dozen or more. Okay, and whether the U.S. legal system can be used to guarantee the expression of the Turkish viewpoint and the alternative suppress the uh, viewpoint of the other side. Well, I think that wins, actually. All right, sorry, Justin. All right. I'll live with it some. But if number one wins, number two and three are obsolete. It's not a genocide. Well, then. I, I, I, I'll, let me actually, I think that's a great point. She, uh, she said that if, if it's considered a genocide under law, then it doesn't matter uh, whether you have the right to suppress or promote your own viewpoint. That's actually not true. Uh, because one thing guaranteed by the freedom of expression in the United States is to lie. You can, you can lie, you can tell an untruth. You can debate something uh, from a viewpoint that may seem absolutely ridiculous, and we can discuss the merits of that unicorn I found in the parking lot. Um, so 
look, whether one can use the legal system to guarantee the freedom of expression of freedom of expression for the Turkish viewpoint on history, the answer generally is yes. But, but what one cannot do is to sue to say that my viewpoint must be included among the marketplace of ideas. It must be included in the cacophony when any subject is being discussed. As, uh, as Sevgin properly put it, what we really do have is a call of arms to sharpen our pencils, to keep writing, to keep speaking. Uh, if anyone has the stomach for it, we've had a series of Republican debates. Um, the winner has been the person who's been most able to outshout the other candidates. Uh, it's not pretty, and it's um, not reflective of the beauty of our system in the United States, or maybe proves the brutality of our system in the United States. Uh, but really, that is what we have. We have a town square, and everyone must shout to get their point across. Uh, so let's look at it from the opposing viewpoint then. Can others do things that keep us out of the square? There the answer is no. They cannot if they do so with some sort of official sanction, and they do so by limiting our expression because they don't like the ideas we are expressing, the content of our expression. So content-based censorship, which means censorship not by a heckler's veto, which is someone shouting louder, but by a government organization, which could be a state university, for example, um, that is not allowed. Can one claim damages for the insult to all Turks or to the Republic of Turkey for the content of the genocide allegation or the skewed viewpoint on history that the Armenians promote? The answer is no. There is no such thing as group defamation. There is no cause of action for that. No state, no ethnic group can be considered a victim under the law. Uh, this is rock solid law in the United States. Uh, the famous case here actually was about the Sopranos TV show. A group of Italian Americans had sued, uh, saying that it disparages them all. Uh, they're right, the Sopranos I think does disparage uh, Italian Americans, uh, though personally uh, having grown up with a person who was arrested as a mafioso and deported right next door to my house in New Jersey. Um, I thought it was pretty accurate. What can I tell you? Uh, um, <laughs> I talk about that later. Um, and so right, no, no group defamation, no national defamation. We don't have that in the United States under the law. Um, can one personally claim that they have suffered damages and recover under the law when they are called a genocide denier or some other slur. Uh, in some respects, yes. There is defamation of individuals in the United States, but merely being called a Turk or merely being having your view reflected by another person who says, I hate your viewpoint and this is it, um, and that constitutes being a genocide denier or that you must hate me or that your ancestors must have hated my ancestors or killed them. Uh, First of all, that might be a true statement, even if it was delivered with venom, so it's not actionable in that case. But if they lie about you, that harms you in some sort of professional way, if they lie about you, that inhibits your advancement. I'm about done here. Um, if they lie about you, that makes you suffer financially, then yes. Uh, one example would be Professor Gunther Louie, who wrote a book uh, that the Armenians didn't like. And for those of you who read it, I thought it was a very balanced book. Um, and he was not trying to, uh, I think, please one side or the other. Uh, but of course, that was his fatal flaw, I think. Um, and he was repeatedly called an instrument of the Turkish state, but more importantly, on the Turkish government payroll. That is an allegation of academic fraud. I think, Justin, you're probably familiar with this accusation. Uh, but not with the money. That never <laughs> seems to come. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, we, we never got to trial. I, I, I was one of the co-counsel for Professor Louie, and we never got to trial on the case, but that was always going to be our shining moment. Where's the money? You know, just look for it. You're never going to find it. Uh, so in a case like that, an accusation of academic fraud, which we were very easy, which was very easy and quick to determine was absolute filth, um, he was able to uh, have his legal fees paid and get a financial settlement uh, and a retraction published by 
uh, what was otherwise a very reputable civil rights organization that had accused him of such a thing. So there's the basic outlines of the law. I look forward to Q&A and also to seeing you later in coffee breaks. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very enlightening uh, uh, talk about uh, where we go from here in a way. But uh, I'd like to perhaps during the Q&A session, I hope we have some time for that, but I'd like to bring it to a really personal level where our children are being kicked out of classes if, when they're asked if they believe in genocide and they say no or I don't know anything about it and they are kicked out of the class. Now there, maybe there is gold in them there are hills. In any case, uh, with that, um, I would like to <clears throat> invite Dr. Turan uh, to, he's the uh, <clears throat> president of Turkish uh, history um, department. And, uh, and I think you have his bio in the, in the booklet, so I don't need to go into that. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that he will go back 1,000 years, not the 100 years that we've been talking about, so at least I'm very curious to hear about what he has to say about the relationship between the Armenians and the Turks going all the way back to 1,000 years. Dr. Turan. Thank you. May I, may I just, I'm sorry. This is going to be Turkish, but, but yes. there will be help in terms of Büyük bir milletin kıymetli evlatları ve günümüz dünyasının en büyük siyasi gücünün harika insanları ve vatandaşları hepinizi yürekten selamlıyorum. Ayrıca eski dünyadan yeni dünyaya gelerek aranızda bulunmaktan ben ve arkadaşlarım çok mutlu olduğumuzu belirtmek istiyorum hassasiyetle. Yine başta Justin McCarthy ve diğer masa arkadaşlarımızın konuşmalarını da burada tebrik ediyorum. That part was, was for the Turks actually. <laughs> I am honored to be here to be with the honorable members of the Turkish Association here. They are all valuable people contributing to this gathering. And I also want to thank uh, the previous speakers, the speakers before us. Short. Biraz önce Justin McCarthy dostumuzun da belirttiği gibi Türkler için Ermeni meselesi önemli bir meseledir. Ama tek mesele değildir. Hakikaten çok sayıda e, meselelerden birisidir. As our friend just, uh, Justin McCarthy already said, Armenian issue is one of the issues for Turks. It's not, it doesn't have a, any priority. It's only one of the problems Turks have. Many problems. Biz de burada e, konuyu e, bakarken e, tarihe e, bir iz düşüm yapmak ist istiyoruz. Çünkü e, bir davanın çözümünde malum olduğu üzere e, hakim veya hakimler işte mutlaka geçmiş hikayesine bakar konunun. Başka türlü e, çözme imkanı yoktur. Yeah. To, pro yeah, to have a better view we better have a historical perspective in short he says okay Müslüman Türklerle Anadolu Ermenilerinin ilk defa karşılaşmaları Selçuk Bey'in torunu Çağrı Bey'in seferiyle olmuştu. Mavera Nehri'de faaliyet yürüten Çağrı ve Tuğrul kardeşler ihtiyaç üzerine Batı'ya bir sefer yapma kararını varmışlardı. Bu karar gereğince Çağrı Bey yanına aldığı 3000 süvari ile 1016 yılında seferini başlatmıştı. Dikkat e, buyurun bu Ermenilerle Türklerin karşılaşmasının birinci yılı içerisindeyiz. Bu da çok özellikli bir zaman dilimi. 
Horasan, İran ve Azerbaycan'ı geçen Çağrı Bey, Anadolu'ya kadar uzanmış. Bu arada Doğu Anadolu'da kuzeyde Ani ve güneyde Vasprakan adında Bizans İmparatorluğu'na bağlı olarak varlıklarını sürdüren iki Ermeni krallığı bulunuyordu. Çağrı Bey her iki krallığa da akınlar yapmıştı. Bu suretle Ermeniler ve Selçuklu Türkleri ilk olarak zamanımızdan bin yıl önce karşılaşmışlardı. Ancak Ermenilerle Türklerin dostane olmayan bu ilk karşılaşmaları 900 yüz yıl sürecek bir beraberliğin kaplarını da aralayacaktı. The first encounter of Muslim Turks and Anatolian Armenians was at the military campaign launched by Çağrı Bey, the grandson of Selçuk. Çağrı and Tural brothers who were operating in Transoxonia decided to launch a campaign to the west out of necessity. In accordance with this decision, Çağrı Bey took 300 cavalry with him and started the military campaign in 1016. Çağrı Bey passed Horasan, Iran and Azerbaijan and reached Anatolia. At that time, there were two Armenian kingdoms in existence, Ani in the north and Vasprakan in the south of East Anatolia under the protection of the Byzantine Empire. Çağrı Bey carried out raids on both of these kingdoms. So we can say that the Armenians and Seljuk Turks came in, in contact with each other for the first time in history exactly 1000 years ago as Professor Turan underlined a minute ago. However, this first encounter, which was not so friendly, would start a relationship that would last 900 years. Büyük Selçuklu Devleti'nin 1040'ta kurulmasından itibaren batıya doğru hareketli bir politika başlamıştı. Türk akıncı birlikleri ve yeni yerler arayan Oğuz aşiretleri Anadolu coğrafyasının kaplarını çalmaya başlamışlardı. Zira Anadolu'da siyaseten var olan Doğu Roma Devleti'nin ağır sosyal ekonomik sorunları ile asayiş problemleri de vardı. Doğu Anadolu'da Rum halkı ile beraber yaşayan Ermeni ve Süryani halk grupları ile ilişkiler kopma noktasındaydı. 11. yüzyıl ortasında Bizans tahtına çıkan 9. Konstantin Monamak Ermeni halkına çok ağır vergiler yüklemiş, ileri gelenlerin de iç Anadolu'ya sürmüştü. Ermeni kilisesi ortadan kaldırılmaya çalışılmış ve bu sebeple dini kıyımlar yapılmıştı. Ermeni yönetici aileleri olan Pakraduni ve Artruni aileleri neredeyse ortadan kaldırılmışlardı. Meşhur Ermeni ve kaynamecisi Urfalı Matyö iktidarsız ve kadınlaşmış berbat Rum milleti Ermenilerin en cesur evlatlarını yurtlarından koparıp dağıttılar. Milletimizi tahrip edip Türklerin istilasını kolaylaştırdılar şeklinde ağır ifadeler kullanıyordu. With the foundation of the Selçuk Empire in 1040, a policy of moving west was adopted. Turkish raider troops and Oğuz tribes which were looking for new locations started to knock the doors of Anatolian geography. The Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine, that politically existed in Anatolia, suffered from heavy socioeconomic problems as well as difficulties to keep law and order. In Eastern Anatolia, their relation with the Armenian and Assyrian population living with the Greek people were at the breaking point. Constantine Monakos, who became the king of the Byzantine Empire in the middle of the 11th century, levied heavy taxes on Armenian people and exiled their leading figures to central Anatolia. Attempts were made to abolish the Armenian church and religious slaughters were carried out for this purpose. The leading Armenian families, the Bagatunis and the Arzunis families were almost eradicated. The famous Armenian chronicler, Matthew of Urfa, used grave expressions such as the impotent, feminized, and terrible Greek people uprooted the bravest children of Armenia from their homelands. They destroyed our nation and thus made the Turkish invasion easier. Suriyani alim Michel ise eserinde şu ifadelere yer veriyordu. Bu devirde Rumlar bizim milletimize ve Ermenilere zulüm yapıyorlardı. Çıkarılan bir emirname ile Batıl mezheplerini bize kabul ettirmeye zorluyorlar, bizi eziyorlardı. İstanbul Patriği kiliselerde bulunan mukaddes kitaplarımızı yakmıştı. Her iki kaynaktaki ifadelerden de anlaşılacağı üzere Ermeni ve Süryani toplulukları Rumlardan büyük ölçüde ayrışmıştı. 
Selçuklu askeri güçlerinin bu dönemdeki Anadolu fetihlerini bu sosyal durum kolaylaştırıyordu. Sultan Alparslan 1064 yılında eski Ermeni başkenti Ani'yi fethetmişti. Buna ilaveten civar bölgelerde Selçuklu hakimiyetini kolayca tanımışlardı. Selçuklu siyasi gücünün Anadolu'ya gelmesi ve Bizans ile boy ölçüşebileceğini göstermesi siyasi hükümranlık yeteneğine sahip olmayan Ermenileri de bir tercihe zorlamıştı. Ermeniler Bizans'a mı yoksa yeni gelen Türklere mi tabi olmalıydılar? Ermeniler yaşadıkları sosyoekonomik şiddet ve sıkıntılar dolayısıyla Müslüman olduklarından dolayı çok da sempati duymadıkları Selçuklara yöneldiler. Özellikle 1071 Malazgirt Muharebesi'nden sonra büyük ölçüde Selçuklarla beraber olmayı kabullendiler ve yeni bir döneme girdiler. Mihail and Asirin intellectual said the following in his work. In that period the Greek were torturing our nation and the Armenians. They issued a decree to subdue us and to force us to accept their invalid religion. The Istanbul Patriarch had our holy books in the churches burned. As is clear from the statements in, in both sources, the Armenian and Assyrian communities were separated from Greeks to, to a great extent. This social situation in that period made the conquest of Anatolia easier for the Seljuk armies. Sultan Alparslan conquered Ani, the former Armenian capital city, in 1064. In addition to this, the adjacent areas recognized the Seljuk dominance without much resistance. The arrival of the Seljuk political power in Anatolia and their apparent power to stand up against Byzantine forced the Armenians, who didn't have the tradition of sovereignty at that time, to make a choice. Should they be contingent upon Byzantine or the Turks? Because of socioeconomic violence they were facing and the difficulties, they had opted for the Seljuks, whom they were not really fond of as they were Muslims. Especially after the Battle of Manziget in 1071, they accepted to be with the Seljuks to, to a great extent and they entered a new era. In 1075, İznik merkezli kurulan Türkiye Selçuklu Devleti'nin kurucusu, kurucu unsuru Selçuklu Türkleri'ydi. <gülüyor> Ancak içinde teba olarak yaşayan halk grupları Türklerle beraber Ermeniler, Süryaniler ve Rumlardı. Özellikle Ermeniler sosyal ve ekonomik hayatın her alanında Müslüman Türklerle ilginç bir beraberlik oluşturdular. Mahallelerde, beldelerde Ermeni sanatkar ve esnaflar ve sanatkarlar ve tüccarlar hiçbir problem olmadan yaşantılarını sürdürdüler. Hatta Selçuklu Devleti hayatına giren Ermeniler oldu. Sultan II. Kılıcarslan çok başarılı bir hükümdardı. Onun kendi gibi başarılı bir veziri bulunmaktaydı. Adı İhtiyarettin Hasan veya Hasan bin Gavras olan bu devlet adamı bir Ermeniydi. Ermenilerin Selçuklu döneminde ve daha sonraki beylikler döneminde herhangi bir dini problem yaşamadıkları muhakkaktır. Beylikler döneminde ruhani merkez Kütahya'dır. Osmanlılar 1329'da Bursa'yı alınca ve başkent yapınca dini merkez Bursa'ya taşınmıştı. 1453'te İstanbul fethedilince Fatih Sultan Mehmet İstanbul'da bir Ermeni patrikliği imtiyazı vermişti. Ayrıca tüccarlardan, zanaatkarlardan çok sayıda Ermeni İstanbul'a iskan etmişti. The major constituent of the Turkish Seljuk Empire that was founded around İznik in, in 75 was the Seljuk Turks. But among the subjects of the empire were Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks, as well as Turks. Especially Armenians started an interest in cooperation with Turks in all aspects of social and economic life. The Armenian tradesmen, artisans, and merchants continued their social and professional lives in settlements and towns without facing any major problems. In fact, there were Armenians who took part in the Seljuk government system. Sultan Kılıcarslan II was a very successful ruler and he had a vizier as such a successor as himself. This statesman, who was called Ihtiyar din Hasan or Hasan bin Karvas, was an Armenian. It is certain that Armenians didn't face any religious, religious problems in the Seljuk period or later in the Beyliks period. In the Beyliks period, the spiritual center was Kütahya for the Armenians. When the Ottomans conquered Bursa in 1329, and made it their capital, their spiritual center was transferred to Bursa. When Mehmet II conquered Istanbul in 1453, he gave the Armenians the, the privilege to have an Armenian 
Patriarchate in Istanbul. Besides, he allowed many Armenian merchants and craftsmen to settle in Istanbul. Günümüzde Ermeni meselesi nereye geldi? Onun üzerinde duruyoruz. Ermeni meselesi çok milletli, çok devletli ve çok boyutlu bir mesele haline gelmiştir. Dünyanın çok sayıda milleti ve devleti konuyla alakalıdır. Dünyanın hemen hemen her yerinde konuya yönelik medyada, haber ya da yazı, yazı çıkabilmektedir. Bu durum tabii ki Ermeni diasporasının, diasporasının kesintisiz faaliyetleri sonucudur. Konunun Ermeniler tarafı çok ısrarlıdır. Hiçbir cevap, hiçbir yazı, hiçbir faaliyet onları bu ısrarından caydıramamaktadır. Son yıllarda 24 Nisan günü bu ısrarlar sebebiyle dünyadaki milyonlarca insanın belleğine konu kazınmıştır. Konu sosyal bilimler açısından üç boyut kazanmıştır. Siyasi boyut, konuyla ilgili 70'in üstünde devlet Ermeni lehinde karar almıştır. Alınan kararın reel politik açısından bu ülkelere kazandırdığı nedir? gerçekten tartışmalıdır. Kararları alan ülkeye ne kazandırıyor? Türkiye ile ilişkilerinde neyi değiştiriyor? Ermenilere kattığı nedir? Gerçekten tartışmalıdır. Bize göre haksız, mesnetsiz ve aynı parlamentolarca geri alınması gerçekten gereken kararlardır. Propaganda boyutu vardır konunun. Ermeni kuruluşları tezlerini savunmak için çok sayıda sahte belge, bilgi ve metin üretmişlerdir. Örnek olarak Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nin o dönemdeki İstanbul Büyükelçisi Morganton'un adına e, e, yazılan e, bir kitap yayınlanmıştır. Ancak kitabın daha sonra Burton Huntrick tarafından kaleme aldığı anlaşılmıştır ve daha pek çok konuyla ilgili sahte bilgi belge bulunmaktadır. Sonuç olarak Türk Ermeni meselesinin geldiği bu noktada unutulmaması gereken husus, İki toplunun yaşadığı bin yıllık tarihtir. Bu tarihin 950 yılı beraberliktir. Son yüzyılda Türkler ve Ermeniler ayrı düşmüşlerdir. Hem de keskin bir uzaklaşmayla ayrılmışlardır. Bir gün gerçekleşir mi bilemiyoruz. Yazılacak objektif ortak bir tarih, tarafların birbirlerini dinler bir hale gelmesi, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti Devleti ile Ermenistan Cumhuriyeti arasında kurulacak akılcı ilişkiler, Toplulukların birbirlerine yönelik yapacağı empati problemi çözme götürecektir galiba başka akılcı bir yöntem de yoktur. The Armenian issue today, the Armenian issue has now become a multicultural, multinational and multidimensional issue. Many nations and governments are involved in this subject. Almost everywhere in the world there may be a, a publication or news in media concerning this topic. This is of course the result of endless efforts of Armenian diaspora. The Armenian side is very persistent on this issue. No answer, no article, no action dissuades them from their persistence. In recent years, the date, 24 April, is imprinted in the minds of millions of people. The subject has gained three dimensions in terms of social sciences. Politically, about this issue, more than 70 governments have taken decision in, in favor of Armenia. What are the gains of these countries in terms of real politics from taking such a decision? This could be discussed. What, can, what does it change in terms of their relations with Turkey? What are the contributions to the Armenians? This should be really discussed. To us, this decision is unlawful and groundless, and it should be withdrawn by the same parliaments. The Armenian institutions have produced a lot of counterfeit documents, information texts, in order to defend their theses. For example, they have published a book titled Borgento's Story, as if written by Borgento, who was then the ambassador of the United States of America in Turkey. But later it was found out that the book was written by someone else, Porton Hendrick. Memoirs of Nadim Bey was published. He was claimed to have raised, uh, resided in Halep. This person never lived in Halep, and someone else wrote the me memoirs. Many more texts were written about this issue without any foundation and facts were distorted. Besides, we also know that similar distortions were made with pictures. It means that this issue has been used as a means of unlimited propaganda. There are a considerable number of Turkish documents about this issue. In addition to these documents, there are many documents in Russia, Germany, France, England, and the United States of America that should be examined. Turkey has explicitly stated their opin her opinion and attitude. She has underlined many times that their archives will be kept open on this issue. Many books which could be judged objective have been published uh, in Turkey as well as abroad. Conclusion. 
The important point which shouldn't be forgotten about the Turkey American issue is they share the history of 1,000 years. For, for 900 years, the nations were together rather than against each other. For the last century, Turks and Albanians have fallen apart, and their fortunes seem to be irreversibly separated. We don't know if they will ever rejoin. In my opinion, the problem could be solved if an objective history is jointly written, if two sides agree to listen to each other, if they can establish rational relations between the two countries, and if, above all, they feel empathy with each other. There seems to be no answer easier said than done. Thank you. Thank you. Çok teşekkürler. Oh, there's a book. Oh, that book. Oh, yeah, you will see that. You wrote that. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. That was a excellent uh, uh, habit. Uh, that was an excellent history from the president of the Turkish History Society in Ankara, Turkey. So, uh, having said that, I know uh, we've used up all our time, and uh, now uh, we'll take one question. And uh, I'd like to remind you all that there is going to be a round table discussion at 5.30, I believe, in, in this room, uh, table F1, where you can actually get intimate with, with the uh, scholars here. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't mean it, dear. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just translating from Turkish, you know. It, does a, it, it has another meaning. Uh, but in any case, so thank you for coming. And, um, but as I say, we'll take one question. One question from, yes, Ergun Bey. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I have two short comments and a question, please. Comment one. I have purchased and read all of Justin McCarthy's books. I recommend that you do the same. If you're, if you're really, really, really, really too busy to buy them, then just buy the last one, because I think the last one is, is really fantastic, especially the last chapter uh, in the last book. It just blew me away. I'm going to be presenting some of that tomorrow morning. Thank you, Professor Justin McCarthy. And thank and you, I might. <laughs> tell Buenos, I have to congratulate you for spotting unusual aspects about this issue. You're plowing the same field like many other scholars, but each and every article that you wrote in the past few years, I have had great admiration for them. I wanted to personally congratulate you for that. Please keep doing what you're doing. I save my question for my good friend, David. David, um, we're really frustrated with these state resolutions, especially as they are reflected in the curriculum. So a few of us, one of them is standing right there on the podium, we're thinking of actually suing, for example, the state of California. And the suing would be based on fact, a technicality, not a historical debate. We're not debating whether it's genocide or not. We're just asking this, or we'd like to ask to the state of California. If you're forcing our children to learn that it's genocide, then produce a court verdict that it is a genocide. Otherwise, you're defrauding the public. Either put it on the table or shut up. So that kind of lawsuit, what is its chance of making it. I'm just, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're brainstorming here. Thank you for asking that question, Ergun Bey. Uh, sure, that's a simple one. Thanks, Ergun Nabi. Um, where did she get that? Curriculum law in American public schools at the primary and secondary level gives tremendous deference to the state leaders. So let's think about what that means. Uh, at a university level, a little different. But at the primary and secondary level, there is a recognition that choices have to be made about what to teach. 
those choices are necessarily political. So in Boston, you're going to learn about the Irish experience, and in Wyoming or Oklahoma, let's say Oklahoma, you're going to learn more about the Native American experience. Uh, because you can't teach the kids everything. Um, so that's the backdrop. So you've posited that this is some sort of fraud or an untruth. A, a two plus two equals five. They're foisting upon your kids. Is there some sort of limit to that? Um, it, we actually come down to really the question is, are there two meanings to the word genocide? And the answer is in the United States, yes. There is a legal definition of genocide and provided by the UN Genocide Convention and the Proxmire Act, which is in the US Code. And uh, no one is deemed to have committed this act until it's been proven in a court of law that provides due process to the accused, one definition. And of course, we know by that standard, there's not been genocide. So this looks like they're perpetrating some sort of two plus two equals five. It's the equivalent of saying, well, gee, O.J. Simpson was guilty of murder, but he wasn't. No school would teach that he was guilty of murder, even in California. But there's also another definition. There's no two definitions of murder, but there, is only, there are multiple definitions of genocide. And there is a common sense definition of genocide. And I, I say common sense only because it's a common parlance definition of genocide. The, the word really does have no existence outside the law, or at least ought not to. Um, California would say, no, everyone knows what genocide is. You don't have to prove it. The United States government, without having a trial, uh, said what was happening in Darfur was genocide, and we sanctioned uh, the Sudanese government for it. So we're sort of uh, harming ourselves. The United States, even the people who make our laws, are saying there's a legal and a non-legal definition. On that basis, I think the lawsuit, though, wise in its conception, I think, would have a very difficult chance at success. If I may add, uh, you know, uh, we talk about freedom of speech, mm -hmm. but there are also articles which show what parts of speech are not protected by the freedom of speech amendment. Sure. Um, Hollering. Fire in a crowded theater. Well, right. Justin's actually absolutely right. There, our freedom of speech in the United States, though expansive, is not absolute. Um, the, those types of speech which pose a public hate, health, safety, or welfare danger can be limited. And then again, it has to be in a narrow, high, uh, narrow manner. Um, I'm not sure where that fits in forcing children to learn something that they disagree with or their parents disagree with, or which is demonstrably false, rises to that level. Uh, the, you know, the fire that may be set off is between your ears, uh, but that just should give you a reason to say, no, this isn't true. Let me provide you the resources uh, that reverses that idea in your head. Let me get my parents and my parents' friends to go to the state education committee meetings and to provide resources that tell the Education Committee when they adopt a curriculum that it ought to be changed. OK, uh, thanks very much. Uh, as I say, if you had some other questions to ask but you didn't get a chance to ask here, uh, please feel free to come to our roundtable discussion, and you'll be able to ask that question. So thanks again. I want to thank the panelists again. This was actually great. Uh, I think we learned quite a bit from the panel. Thank you very much.